In this example, we're asked to find the zeros of the following equation and then draw a rough sketch. Not a precise graph, but just a rough sketch of the function itself. So we start by rewriting our equation, negative 2x to the fourth plus 16x squared minus 32 equals zero. We need to always make sure before we solve polynomial equations that one side of the equation is zero. It is in this case. Now had this 32 been on the other side, we would first have to subtract it over make sure that the equation is set equal to zero before moving on. Hopefully this reminds you of an example that we did in the previous section. Uh, these were called quadratic forms or polynomials in quadratic forms. Uh, they're just wearing a costume, but they're really just quadratic equations on the inside. And the way we confirm that is by making sure that this degree is twice that of the middle term or that the middle term is half, the degree of the middle term is half the degree of the leading term. Whenever that's the case, these are probably quadratic in nature. And we solve these by letting our favorite letter, in this case I'm using U again, but again, there's nothing mystical or special about the letter U. You can use any other letter that you prefer. Oops. So if you let U equal to X squared, we can square both sides and get U squared equals X to the fourth. And now we make the substitution. So X to the fourth gets replaced with U squared x squared gets replaced with u. The negative 32 just comes along for the ride. There's no variables attached to it, so nothing changes there. We can factor out a GCF of negative two here. And again, as a reminder, how do we know what goes on the inside? We divide each of these terms by the GCF. So negative two u squared divided by negative two would give us u squared. 16u divided by negative two would give us negative eight u negative 32 divided by negative two gives us positive 16. Hopefully we recognize this as a perfect square. This is the square of u minus four. So that's exactly what we write here. We factor it as negative two times u minus four times another u minus four equals zero. U can be back substituted in for x squared now. Again, we, if we start the problem in x land, we can go to u land for a vacation but we have to go home. We have to go back to x land before we end the problem. So u gets replaced again with x squared. So now the equation becomes negative two times x squared minus four times x squared minus four equals zero. This can be factored further. This is a difference of squares. So this factors to x plus two times x minus two. This is the same exact thing. So it also factors to x plus two times x minus two. Now at this stage, we have one, two, three, four, five things being multiplied, and the answer is zero. So the zero product property can be invoked here to say, one of these has to be zero. We have no idea which one, but one of them must be zero. So we start at the beginning. Can negative two ever equal zero? That's not possible. Now you might be wondering, well, why did we set the two x here equal to zero when we solve the equation? The reason why is that this has a variable attached to it. Two by itself will never equal zero. You can never turn two into a zero or a negative two into a zero for that matter. But if we have a two x here, this x can assume any number you want. So if x assumes to be zero, which is what we ended up here with, this whole thing will go down to zero. However, there is absolutely nothing you can do to negative two to get converted or to convert it into a zero. That's not possible, so this will not affect our choices at all. We can either set x plus two equal to zero, or we can set x minus two equal to zero. What, either this could be zero, or this could be zero, or both of these could be zero. And because these are repeats of these two roots, or these two factors, we don't have to address these again. You can, you don't have to. So if x plus two equals zero, you get x equals negative two. And if x minus two equals zero, we get x equals positive two. Now what you do have to be careful with is that this is a repeated factor or that x equals negative two is a repeated root. Because the repetition happens twice, or if we were to condense this, we would write this as x plus two, the quantity squared. And then we would write this as x minus two, the quantity squared, because there's two of those terms. And if we look back, anytime we have an even power, 
the graph either touches or bounces off of the x-axis. It does not cross it. It just bounces off of it. So here's where a couple of rough calculations come in to help us. We know that there's an x-intercept or a zero or a solution or a root at x equals negative two and at x equals two. We know that the curve has to bounce because the uh, repeated root has an even power. x plus two is being squared, x minus two is being squared as well. We can find the y-intercept pretty easily. If we plug in zero for x, this term goes away, this term goes away, and we're just left with negative 32. So I know that the y-intercept is right here. And finally, the negative two actually comes to our rescue here. It tells us what the end behavior of this quartic equation is going to be. So if it's an even degree, it's either up, up, or down, down. If the leading coefficient is negative, then we know that the end behavior on both sides has to be the function going down to negative infinity. So we can draw a rough sketch and say, this will go down to negative infinity. It's gonna come up, bounce here, and then go down to the y-intercept, go up again, bounce, and then come back down. So that's how we can come up with a rough sketch of the graph of the function. Last example, now we're doing, back, we're doing things backwards in this example. Instead of being asked to solve an equation, the question is giving us what the zeros are, it's telling us what the leading coefficient is, and it's asking us to come up with the polynomial function. So we have a leading coefficient of one, that tells us that this leading coefficient will be one. We're told that the zeros are one and negative two. So we're doing the same thing that we did right here, but backwards. We're given this step, and we have to go back to the previous one to come up with what the factors would be. So if x is equal to one, that implies that if we subtract the one over to the other side, x minus one would have to equal zero. Also, if we know that x is equal to negative two, if we add the two over to the other side, that would imply that x plus two is equal to zero. So this gives us the other factor. This gives us the first one. So we know that our function has to be the product of the two factors because we would have used the zero product property to come up with these two numbers, one and negative two. Where would they have come from? They would have come from x minus one times x plus two. Now, if the question requires, uh, or if you're required to, or you feel like it, you can multiply this out to give the answer in standard form. But I can leave, I'm hoping, that everyone at this stage in the course is comfortable with foiling things out. This would be x times x, which is x squared, x times two, which is two x, negative one times x is negative x, negative one times two is negative two. So you would simplify this and rewrite it as x squared plus x minus two. Hope that helps. We'll see you in the next chapter.